Okay. Oh, is this being recorded? Uh, yeah, I'll be up on YouTube. Are you okay with that? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, y'all can get on camera if y'all feel comfortable with that. I would, but I was eating, so I'm probably gonna <laughs> wait till I finish my I food. Oh, I feel lonely now. It's okay. Everyone's super happy to see your face. <laughs> yeah, if anyone needs the sign-in link, it's here. Um, I should just put this in chat, actually. Here you go. Yeah, I don't know if there's a way to pin it. But... There's also, like, you can use your phone to, like, take a picture of the screen, which is amazing. Yes. So it's there in chat. And then um, uh, we, we have the link to the slides that we'll post again maybe in a couple minutes if you want to follow along while watching the presentation. Yeah. Cool. So let's get started. Yeah, so uh, we're Neurotech at UCSD. Uh, we're affiliated with this parent organization called Neurotech X, which is a kind of like a global nonprofit that focuses on neurotechnology and uh, the research and industry aspects of it. It's a kind of a group that just has conferences all around the world. They have a lot of hubs in different cities like Neurotech San Francisco and other ones like that. And we just wanted to, you know, actually have a community in San Diego. So we're the first branch there. Uh, our plan was to do a competition this year with the Neurotech X, but of course that has been delayed. But Neurotech X does run a student competition every year. So if you're interested in that, you can join us. And next year we will definitely compete for a prize, I think of $5,000. And then uh, other things about our club, we have a faculty advisor. His name is uh, Vikash Gilja. He's part of the ECE department. He teaches a grad course on neurosignal processing, and he's a really nice guy. So if you ever need to get in contact with him or want to meet him, he will probably be coming to our events next year when they're back to being in person. In addition, we have a, a sponsorship with this company known as Wearable Sensing, who main part of the reason why they joined us as a sponsor is because they want to find people to join their company. So if you're interested in working in neurotech, we have one of their headsets so you can get used to their technology and we have connections with the CEO. So he is really willing to interview people who really are interested in this field and have uh, experience. And uh, last but not least, uh, our main goal for this club is to give people project groups experience so they can put things on their resume and they can get experience in this field since this field is kind of hard to major in or get actual experience in classes. So if you want something for your resume, if you want to work on a software project, an ML project, or you know any sort of project in this field, uh, join us next year and you'll be able to work with multiple headsets. We own uh, three headsets, or two, but we can also get one, uh, a cheap one from the Cogsite department, but we own an OpenPCI headset and a wearable sensing DSi 7 headset. And both of those will be available for project groups. And uh, thank you for listening to the introduction. And I think Jiling is going to do most of the presentation today. But if you have any questions, just put them in the chat and uh, me and Yudong can answer them. Sounds good. Thank you so much. So um, today we're going to learn a little bit more about how we can get started with BCI projects. Um, just to get a show of hands and, I mean, check marks. Um, who here has taken COGS 189? This is the brain-computer interface class. So you have, if you have not, you can put a no up. OK. Looks like most people have not. OK, a couple people have. Who has TA'd COGS 189? Oh, uh, I know Colin or Yun Dong you have, so there's at least one person. Um, so a handful of people have taken the class and then one person has TA'd the class and we also have another board member who has also TA'd the class. So we have quite a few experienced members here. Um, so I kind of also want to hear from you guys, um, what are, why would you want to do a BCI project? Like what, what interests you about it? So if you want to um, just hop on mic and say something, then you're welcome to do so. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off just to break the silence so it's easier if anyone else wants to join. But I think 
something that's really cool about BCI projects. And well, the first reason why I even joined this club in the first place was that I thought neuroscience was a really, really cool topic, but I was not 100% sure if I wanted to major in it. So I majored in computer science as well because I knew I liked technology. And BCI kind of gives like this really nice middle ground where you don't feel like you're hardcore going into like, I have to PhD do research right away. But at the same time, you get exposure to that neuroscience aspect and really fun aspects of uh, that part of, you know, STEM without having to devote 100% into biology or thinking about med school or something. But in addition, the field is a super new field that has been exploding in industry without a real good foundation in education. And I think that's part of the reason why I also wanted to do this uh, club. And then because uh, industry, I think Julian will talk about it in a bit, but a lot of industry, a lot of companies are really focusing on finding people now who are in this field, but there isn't really a community that fosters them really well. Like there's no set major for this field. There's no, there's not very many clubs for this field. So I think it's a really cool area that is really underdeveloped despite of all the hype. So I think it's a really cool field to get into because of that. Okay, hi. Uh, my name is Yunu Wang. I'd like to share my experience. Uh, I was the TA for COX-29, as Jilin just said. So the reason why I want to get into COX, uh, especially like BCI, is because first, it's pretty cool, uh, as everyone agreed. Second one, the reason why, why I like uh, BCI is because I want to like apply my machine learning knowledge, uh, like how to use machine learning algorithm to solve those complicated uh, problems in, in, BC, in BCI, right? <clears throat> so as we can see that, uh, like since the growing of the, the, the development of machine learning, the BCI algorithm also developed. And uh, nowadays we can see that there are so many like fascinating uh, results from the combination between neuroscience, uh, new technology and uh, machine learning. And so that's why I joined the, the BCI team, I, that's why I also like join Neurotech X because I want to be a part of it and I want to like uh, share my experience you, applying my machine learning background to this field. All right, thank you. Hi, I guess I'll share uh, a bit. Uh, my name is Leander, a uh, recent alumni of UCSD. Um, I think the one interesting thing about BCI and the reason why I'm most interested in getting my own personal BCI project started is um, having had a bit of experience looking at these larger companies and seeing the direction that they're heading. Uh, at the end of the day, what the intention for all of this would be is to kind of develop systems or develop more approachable ways to understand BCI as a whole. If it's going to become a technology that is widely used in the future, it seems like it's going to be one of the technologies that will be likely used in our generation's future. Um, it, it's important that we grasp like a basic understanding of how to build smaller projects, how to build uh, tutorials, curriculum, um, just communities around technology that will be impactful. And I think BCI is definitely one of those spaces. Okay, cool, thanks for sharing. Does anyone else want to share? How about you, Julie? Why the why are you interested in BCIs? Yeah, so um, as a lot of you you all have said, it's pretty hard to get into this field without like actually focusing on specifically doing something with the brain-computer interface. Um, because a lot of the things that we learn in engineering, for example, it's uh, there's, there's a whole variety of things you do learn. Um, but like once you want to get into the intersection between engineering and neuroscience and trying to bridge the gap from computation within your own brain and the computation that has exploded so recently inside silicone and our computers and technology, um, being able to bridge that gap is a very niche topic that doesn't really exist much in our coursework yet. And so sort of exploring on your own in order to be able to do a BCA project and really grasp 
what are the fundamentals for what you need to be able to get into this field will allow you to see that there are so many different technologies, ideas, engineering principles, science, scientific ideas that you would need to be able to put together in order for this to, to all work together. And so one thing that's really beautiful about this area, I think, is that not only is it an area of focus that is very niche, but it also requires so many different people with so many expertises to work together. Um, so I think that I find that super, super exciting. And so you have many people that are um, experts in so many areas that will have to work together. Um, so yeah, that's BCI projects themselves. They're like a first stepping stone into um, being able to work in this industry. And so um, as a college student, uh, trying to get a little bit more experience and understanding of how these things work um, is definitely gonna add to your experience and being able to talk about these technologies with companies or research labs in the future. Cool, so if, there, if no one else has anything they want to add, I will move on. Um, all right, so today in the presentation outline, we're gonna talk a little bit about the world of BCIs as we know it today, and a little bit about some example BCI projects to get your minds running about like, what are some cool things we can do? Um, a little bit of an overview of some hardware and walking through some data processing, some anal analyzing, and some machine learning techniques that you might want to use on data like this. And if we have time, we'll go through some code. Um, but if we don't have time, then we'll save that for next week. We're planning to make this into a weekly sort of workshop. So um, hopefully these will all build up on each other. And at the end, you have the opportunity to fill out an interest form to allow us to rank which one you would like to see next, because a lot of times it's not perfectly serial either. Um, we want to prioritize uh, things you guys want to learn first. Cool, so let's get started. All right, so the world of BCIs is fairly diverse. Um, it initially started mostly in research, um, groups in neuroscience, groups in electrical engineering, groups in CS and machine learning. Um, they developed their own things and then they found ways to like sort of connect these ideas together. Um, recently in 2018, DARPA funded about $65 million to a handful of research labs to develop non-invasive technologies in order to find new ways to interface with the brain, to read new data, to read different types of data like ultrasonic sensors rather than just electrodes that you stick on your face or your forehead or your like back of your head or anywhere. Um, so a lot of these methods, they require like a deep understanding of like electrical engineering, a lot of materials engineering. Um, so a lot of that's happening under the DARPA grant. Um, but a lot of labs, even here at UCSD, uh, we focus a lot about the machine learning aspect in trying to understand how we can take high dimensional data and then make sense of that. So we can predict whether or not this person, for example, is um, sad or happy or something that is going on inside their head. Um, so that, that's just a list of some of the top universities that come to mind when um, we think of BCIs. And specialized companies, I'm pretty sure you all have heard about Neuralink. That's Elon Musk's company um, that is, is pretty much a startup right now. They, they are focusing on kind of like the hardware um, in order to build a way to interface with the brain with a little bit more precision than the current non-invasive technologies. And then there's also Kernel, which is another company that um, they're focusing on like memory prosthetics. So ways to interface the brain with chips that can allow you to remember more things because we know that computers are great at mem remembering things, but humans, uh, I'm pretty sure like, you know, from like your exams, taking exams and stuff, if you don't have photographic memory, you might find it hard to remember some facts. Um, so trying to like bridge those two gaps would be really helpful. And there's Control Labs, which uh, was recently acquired by uh, Facebook actually, but they did something really cool where they used um, EMG and like nerves inside your wrist in order to predict what your hands are actually doing. So you get like high precision um, from these like biological features that is read from your wrist in order to understand exactly where your hand is. So that's pretty cool too. So there's a whole range of like these different types of technologies. Um, and finally there's like large companies too, um, like 
Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, they're all trying to hire cognitive neuroscience for, for some reason. I'm not sure why Apple's doing that, but um, everyone's like kind of dipping their feet into BCIs now that it's kind of a developed technology and has grown out of the lab. Um, so a lot of companies are also doing research. Um, do, does anyone know what this logo on the top right is, this, this yellow X? If you know it, you can check mark. If you don't, you can stay silent, I guess. Okay, yeah, I actually didn't know what it was either. It's actually Google's moonshot company. So, oh, oh, cool, Yonda, you know. Okay, I see. I see. Some people are using the check marks on the cameras. Um, I, I'm not able to see all that, so I'm sorry if I miss anyone's thing. Um, but yeah, that's Google's moonshot company. It's it's like a, sort of like their trial stuff, and so they 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 have like a whole section of people trying to look into. BCIs and things like that as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, Yonda, I know you have some experience with some companies. Would you like to add on to anything here? Uh, without fully breaking NDAs, I guess what we can say is um, from like some of the companies you've mentioned here, there's a really big push towards making uh, BCI also a commercial software uh, utilizing its capabilities to make it uh, make it more of a consumer based product um, and finding ways that it can impact consumers and um, in improving their lives improving their abilities to as you mentioned um, memorize things or perform certain tasks there's an array of tasks that BCI has the potential to help us with and the approach is rather than just using it, rather than only using it in the medical field, um, also using it in the consumer uh, personal lifestyle field. Um, yeah, that's all I can really say. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks for adding on. Um, yeah, so as Leonda says, um, there's a bunch of companies that I did not list here and they all focus on, or a lot of them focus on like either the software aspect, the application aspect, or the hardware aspect of BCIs. And so if you're interested in this field, you can sort of like try to funnel yourself into one of those areas and then try to like build from there to see how you can contribute the best. Okay, so some types of BCI projects that you might be thinking about. Um, I sort of categorize this into like approximately three to four categories in case you're interested in starting any BCI project. Um, the most basic one is the mental state prediction sort of project where you sort of predict what's going on inside someone's head. So um, something like emotions, cognitive load, um, these things can be useful when you're, for example, developing an application inside the computer, you want to understand how the user is reacting to it. Uh, a high emotional intelligent computer slash application can be very useful for uh, being able to interface with a person better. And for cognitive load, one example might be to help optimize learning. So, as a student, you might realize that sometimes the material gets too hard, sometimes it's too boring. Um, if we can understand when it's too boring or when it's too difficult, then we can optimize the amount of information or difficulty level that you would require and then optimize the speed at which you can intake information. Um, so that's another application. The controllers type of BCI project is also very widespread and widely researched. Um, so a lot of people are trying to improve the amount of bits that you can get out of a, a BCI interface in order to control games, cursors, prosthetics. And so um, a lot of it's like information theory in this area to try to like optimize these things and have algorithms be able to pick out the most uh, useful features that humans can control with their brains. Um, there's also another area called neurofeedback. This one was kind of controversial for a bit. Um, it still kind of is controversial because a lot of the like devices that people are selling right now are not like, it's kind of hard to tell if they actually work because the data set is kind of small. But the basic idea um, of this is actually pretty interesting is that if you can understand how your brain looks like in a certain state and you want to achieve that state of brain state for, for some reason. For example, if you wanted to learn how to fly a fighter pilot jet, um, you could take information about how the brain looks like and you can somehow impose that into, onto your own brain to make you 
learn it faster. Um, they've actually done studies on training amateur pilots into be able to fly fighter jets uh, by using brain recordings from uh, fighter jet pilots and then imposing that onto the amateur pilots. And then they're able to see some increase in learning between amateur pilots who got that versus who did not. Um, another application might be for like ADHD uh, kids or adults even, uh, where you positively reinforce the fact that you need to focus or be able to control your focus. And so by being able to understand what the brain state looks like when someone is focused, uh, would allow for this computer to know, oh yeah, this guy's focusing, so here is a gold star or here is, here is something that they like. Um, and then if they're not, then you kind of like punish them, but usually positive reinforcement learning works better. So um, let's just stay with that. So those are three main categories uh, where you have computer understand what you think, computer, you controlling computer with highest information output, and computer understanding what you think and also being able to train you into a certain state. On the right is a very beautiful picture of neural art. It is from Random Cork Art of Feeling where they got people to wear EEG devices and sort of conjure up an emotion. And the colors here represent the emotion they're approximately feeling. And the waves in the actual uh, neural art, they actually sort of draw out lines and things. It's actually like a swarm dynamic thing. So it actually looks really cool. It looks kind of like brain data sort of like flowing out onto the screen. So um, I thought, yeah, that's just an interesting way to sort of help visualize the data. There's also been like other fun little things like people putting on headsets and then having uh, dishes of water around them and then sort of conjuring up different emotions and then the, the things around them sort of move in different ways. So you can sort of interact with your brain like even outside of your body, which is pretty amazing. Cool. Is there any questions about this? Cool. I see there's some comments. That's great. Y'all can feel free to keep chiming in there. I, I probably won't be able to respond to that too quickly. So if there is anything that I need to respond to, just uh, let me know, like on mic. All right, so my so my, some example projects. These are pretty cool. So mine click is okay. So these example projects are from this thing called Brainy Hack, which Google was like the host of for like some brain hackathon in like a couple years ago. And so these were some projects that they had from that hackathon. Um, so like one of them was when we were talking about how like mental state prediction. If we can predict what when someone's happy, when they're seeing certain photos, then we can advertise them better, like give them better types of advertisements that they would enjoy. Um, also like be able to provide them better websites that they would like more or photos, things like that. So it's kind of like neuromarketing. That's, that's what the field is called. There's also, yeah, we were talking about learning enhancement. So you take EEG, have learning sessions, and you tell them real time when they should stop learning or rest, and that, that will help uh, produce like this sort of optimal flow of information to the person. Um, so that, that's pretty cool. And another one that's really cool that you actually a team for Neurotech X's annual competition did and they actually won first place was a VCI operated wheelchair. And so this thing basically you just have the person wear an EEG device, they think about like which direction they want to go and through being able to understand the data in analytics and different things like that, you can predict where they want to go and then have the wheelchair actually move in that direction. Um, so that's pretty cool. The sort of real life way to transport yourself with your brain, other than using your legs. Cool. Um, so actually, um, does anyone have any project ideas that they're interested in sharing? You can share it in chat or just speak it on Mike, up to you. Playing StarCraft. Ooh. I'm not too familiar with StarCraft, but if there, you want to elaborate on that. There was someone in our 189 group who, or class, who uh, 
used a headset to basically count as a button press. So whenever they were relaxed or something, they uh, they were able to press a button without pressing it physically on the keyboard. So for instance, for StarCraft, I mean, I guess you could use it for the function keys to like move the screen, like F1, F5. So you can make it so you can control where the screen goes with your mind, maybe for two or three buttons if you want it. And that's some sort of cool project you could probably do. Yeah, so that's a good point is that a lot of the projects that we will do is like probably fairly low like bit rate sort of output. Um, but like as you understand more and more algorithms and more techniques, then you'll be able to optimize different parts of the workflow and be able to understand more parts of different mental states. Yeah, yeah. So for gaming, there's actually some pretty cool ideas where if you have different parts of the screen sort of flash at different rates, you can get different frequencies in your visual cortex. And so this would allow for a computer to understand where you're looking, even though the actual flashing may not be like super visible. So you can like say, oh, I want to like go left. They look kind of in the left part of your screen. Then your little character like sort of walks left. Um, that would be pretty cool in order to be able to have characters sort of be controlled rather than using WAS or something. So then you can use WAS for like shooting stuff or something. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So if there's no one else wants to share about that. Um, yeah, just some ideas might be um, sort of like there's this, okay, I'll, sh I'll share with you this later, so I don't, I don't spoil it right now, okay. <laughs> All right, so what does a PCI project flow sort of look like? Um, you first have to acquire data from this guy's head, and then you have to process it, and then you have to extract features, and you translate that somehow into feeding it into the computer systems that we have now to provide feedback. So this is kind of like a neurofeedback thing we were talking about. Um, even with like mental state prediction stuff, it's pretty much only useful if you actually like give it back to the user somehow, like giving them better websites to look at, like things like that. Um, so this is kind of like the four steps that we'll look at today. And if we get some time, we'll look in the code. All right, so some data acquisition techniques are listed here. Um, I'll sort of overview this by saying, at the bottom left corner, there's this guy in a research lab. This is kind of what a traditional headset in a research lab would look like, where you have a bunch of high quality amplifier electrodes. They're most likely amplifying here. So each one of the little electrodes here on this guy's head, they actually amplify the signals directly and they send it to, or actually it could be also in the box, I'm not sure. But like usually there's like an amplification process that happens before it gets sent to the computer. Um, but the good thing about this is that you pretty much get like the standard 1020 layout on someone's head. So you know exactly where your electrodes are. And you can also have wet gel electrodes in this case, which would provide a very good con conductivity with the actual scalp. So that would allow for a uh, higher quality, uh, higher quality signals. Because if you think about it, if you have dry electrodes, it's possible that like it moves around or like some piece of hair like gets in there or um, maybe some sweat starts to appear, then it gets to be especially conductive. Um, that can like really uh, muck up your data. So usually in research experiments for psycho experiments, they would do something like in the bottom left corner. But those things cost approximately like 20K. So you probably don't want to start with that. Um, Something that is kind of a little bit easier to use, but kind of also expensive is the one on the top left. That's the wearable sensing DSi-7. And that one, they, or I'm not sure if it's exactly DSi-7, but it's one of, it looks very similar to it. And they might have developed this one specifically for like military use. So they're planning to put this in like military helmets and things like that to be able to collect information from our soldiers. And these are special because the little electrodes, they kind of like press on your head and they're not wet electrodes, but they're still very high quality electrodes. So because they can push down your head and also they have like some special coating on them, 
it allows them to pick up like more uh, similarly high quality signals as you would be able to get from the research lab ones. Um, there's also the open PCI, which is the one right next to it. Um, you can see that's pretty similar to like what you might want to use in the lab. Uh, but like this one is like a hackier version where you pretty much have the flex flexibility to put your electrons wherever you are, where you, wherever you want. Um, the great thing about um, open PCI is that they already have like pre-made uh, 3D printing available STLs. So you can actually print out your own headset without having to pay them like hundreds of dollars for it. Um, and then you can also buy these electrodes to like put wherever you want. Um, they also have like headband versions where you can put them on a like just a headband and a lot of different types. So yeah, I can go in, into more of that if you're interested in like the hackier open source version. And on the right, you get the commercial hardware. You get something as simple as a NeuroSky where you only get one electrode. You get the Muse where uh, you have like five electrodes on the forehead and you have like some reference in the ears. And you also get the Emotive, which has several electrodes on either side of the head. Um, yeah, the Muse is usually used for like meditation purposes. They have their own app and everything, but you can also like hack into it to be able to get the data. So pretty cool. You don't have any questions yet? Cool. All right, so some data cleaning. Um, once you get the data, there's actually a lot of things that get picked up by the electrodes because brain waves are actually very small. They're like 100 microvolts or so in amplitude. So anything greater than that, you would probably see it in your data. Um, so a couple things you might see is like the power line noise, which is very apparent around us if we have any sort of um, wall outlet or anything plugged into the wall. So even if you're not like directly sticking your fingers into the wall, you there's like a lot of, of this 60 hertz around you that get into the headset. So we need to figure out how to get that out of it. There's also most muscle artifacts. Whenever you move your eyeballs, you close your eyeballs, you clench your jaw. Um, all of these produce uh, voltages, voltage differences too, because a lot of the biological things that move around in your face and stuff um, are like dipoles. So, and voltage is basically a change in electric voltage. So, um, any of those changes would also impact your EEG data, which you don't want because muscle artifacts is not necessarily brain data. So we want to get rid of that. Uh, there's also voltage drifts. So if you're recording for a few minutes or longer than that, there's going to be some low frequency drift in your electro voltages. So we want to get rid of that in case of like the electro dries out a little bit or what do we call it? There's also session to session differences. So if you, um, want to record today versus tomorrow. Um, there's ways you can average out the DC offset. So there's like some average of today, which is going to be different from the average of tomorrow. So subtracting that out will kind of give you a starting ground as to being able to compare the data. Um, that's still a pretty big question in BCIs is being able to sort of use BCIs across sessions. So um, if you're interested in that, that's a pretty big area of study. Okay, so data cleaning, this is an example of raw EG data. Um, you can see that the voltage like definitely is not a straight line in the horizontal direction and that it somehow like decreases over time pretty dramatically. And you can also see that the right and left electrodes, which is represented in different colors here, um, they may have different slopes. So one may decrease faster than another. So this is usually represented if you have studied signal processing as something in a very low frequency domain because um, you only get like maybe half a period in this case over the entire thing. It's not really a period anyway. It's like if you were to extrapolate this. Okay, I won't get into it. But anyway, it's a low frequency like change, right? You don't see like a ton of little squiggles. So you want to be able to filter that out. Um, yeah, so there's that. Once you filter it out, um, Basically, I just bandpassed this from 0.1 hertz to 50 hertz. 
And this allows us to get rid of some of the 60 hertz um, power line noise and also that weird um, slope that we saw before. So that looks pretty good. Yay. OK, now we want to get rid of some blink artifacts. So what you can do, one of the, the most uh, useful techniques is to IC decomposition, something like this. Um, usually with ICA, you would want to, oh, so ICA is independent component analysis. And usually you would want a few more electrodes, maybe like 10 or 12 to be able to do this like actually well for like specifically eye blinks. Um, but in this case, I only show you four. So um, just keep that in mind. But like when you see these EEG data right here, so on the left, you can see regular EEG data looks kind of like the squiggles where it goes from negative 100 microvolts to 100 microvolts. Um, you can see when you blink, it becomes kind of dramatic and you're like, whoa, what was that? Then after that, you, you get like regular EEG data again. So you want to be able to take out the component um, that caused the eye blinks. And so when you do independent co component analysis, it actually like strips the, the information into the independent component sources that would have given you this data. So once you de decompose it, you can see that one of the um, components looks a lot like the eye blinks that we just saw. And so once we uh, figure out which one that it is, we take it out and then we basically reconstruct the signals from the remaining components, we can get something that looks like this that doesn't really have as much of the um, eye blink data as before. Yay! Okay, cool. So now we got rid of eye blink data, we got rid of the 60 uh, hertz noise, and we also got rid of some drifting across the session. Let us see what we can do with that. EEG data now, hopefully kind of clean. We got some brain data. Um, does anyone have any questions about data cleaning? And I have a question. Yeah. Um, so when you do ICA, is that, how is that different from like a peak to peak uh, analysis of the, for removing eye blinks? Cool. Do you know so what I'm talking about? A peak to peak, do you mean by like looking at the amplitude? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so peak to peak, um, that's a that's a pretty traditional way to do it too. Um, in EEG lab, which is the MATLAB software that you would usually use to analyze EEG data, that's kind of how they would do it. So you set mm -hmm. a threshold of like, okay, anything above this voltage, you would think is a um, eye artifact or some muscle artifact or something, some artifact yeah. that is not brain data. The thing is that is that uh, you could blink a, a small amount and then it would still, it could potentially be under the threshold. Um, uh -huh. So if you think about it, like there may be some cases where um, just because of where you put the threshold, you may be throwing out certain data or keeping certain data that you um, may not want. Um, another downside to that is that once you identify, you sort of have to delete that data. Um, but with ICA, you can sort of reconstruct the data at in this time frame and like understand what the um, data would have looked like without that one eye blink component if we identified that properly. Got it. Okay. Yeah. An analogy for our understanding ICA would be sort of like if you had a microphone in the center of a room and then you had like multiple people talking around it, then it would be able to sort of take apart uh, the different speakers that contributed to the actual sound waves that it got because when you have when you hear something you actually get the summation of all the amplitudes of everything coming towards you right yeah um, yeah yeah so it's able to take that signal and decompose it into the different sources so if one of the sources gives you the eye blinks then you know hey i'm just going to ignore that and then only listen to the other ones okay cool thanks yeah yeah this is kind of like the standard for now um, there has been other techniques like regression where you sort of like predict whether or not something is an eye blink. Uh, but that, that method was kind of old, like 10 years old now. So this, this way is usually the best way if you have enough data. So for, for, for channels, it's probably not enough. Um, so collect as much data as you can.
Okay, cool. So, I had another quick question. Uh, so you're mentioning all of these techniques and maybe this would be for a different like meeting, but could you talk about what type of software would you recommend looking into if you were more interested in like enterprise, what type of language or, or research based? Because you mentioned EEG lab, which is exclusively MATLAB, which is heavy in the research world, but I'm sure that isn't like consistent across everything. Right. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of different, um, things. I, I didn't make a slide about this, unfortunately, but like, um, I've mostly worked with Python. So a lot of the libraries in Python that have been developed around um, EEG analysis, for example, MNE, um, EEG analysis, MEG analysis, and a lot of different brain types, brain data types of analysis is available through that. Um, it's also packages like NeuroDSP, um, Scikit-Learn, or SciPy, um, and NumPy, and XDF files, and um, PyEEG, and things like that, um, would allow you to sort of like decompose this information, like actually. Um, I can show you more of that probably in a future uh, workshop too. Yeah, that would be good. Cool. So if there, if there's no more questions, I'll continue. Um, <laughs> thank you. So feature extraction, um, th this is kind of like how you want to sort of understand the data and pick out important information that we can sort of use in our machine learning techniques. So some things that we've done in the past that's pretty quick to do is take the raw statistics. Like you want to know, okay, what's the mean of this data? What's the standard deviation of this piece of data? Um, there's also things called first and second differences, which allow you to see the variance between this, this time frame and the right before time frame, or this time frame and the right before, right before time frame. And that sort of gives you like a sort of smoothed out variance sort of thing. And so those are raw statistics that you can get directly from the time series data. Um, if you want to look at the power frequency domain, um, so when you take a signal, if, if you're not familiar with uh, signal processing, you can understand a signal in terms of a sum of sine waves, which just means that, okay, we have sine waves that go this fast or faster or have really long waves. And once you sum them up, you get certain types of uh, signals. You, get, you can build like pretty much any signal from a sum of different powers, different amplitudes of these sine waves of different frequencies. And so uh, a lot of EEG analysis has actually been built on being able to transform the time series data into this frequency analysis. And by looking at how much of each power bin we have, like for example, the alpha, alpha band, which is uh, eight to 12 Hertz, we can see whether or not this person is like sleepy or this person is more alert because because of neuroscience uh, we know that there are certain features of um, the brain that happen when you're like a little bit more sleepy for example like more things are more synchronized at a certain frequency so then we can look at these power bins and then use them as a feature you can also do like different things like the difference between electrode powers. Um, you can take ratios of things like that. So alpha divided by beta or like beta divi divided by beta. Um, and then by looking at these differences and ratios, we can kind of extract some more features from the data. Um, there's also event related potentials. So this is also, this is back in the time series domain where you can see, oh, I want to press this space bar and there is event related brain activity that allows you to sort of prepare for pressing the space bar. And if you can sort of detect that, then you can predict when someone's gonna press the space bar. Um, the thing with most of the devices right now is that they're kind of noisy. So you would have to take a lot of trials and average them. Um, but some common things that people have done is like the P300 where uh, it's, it's kind of like the surprise uh, brain related potential or event related potential. So when you see something that you did not expect, um, 
you'd be like, whoa, and that part of your brain like, lights up like crazy. And then you can use that um, to sort of do whatever controlling power you want on your computer. So P means positive, 300 means 300 milliseconds. So it happens approximately 300 milliseconds after the stimulus and is a positive, positive peak rather than negative peak. <laughs> um, there's also event-related desynchronization that is related to motor activity. So if you were to imagine or like move your arm, for example, then there's gonna be actually a decrease in alpha power in your motor cortex when you do that. So you can sort of see when someone's like moving around and stuff. Then visual evoked potentials, kind of, I kind of touched on this before with the game example, gaming example, where you can um, sort of show the user different visual things and then have that sort of be the way that you use to understand what the user is doing or wanting to do. Um, so at the bottom, there's just like a couple examples of what those would look like. You can look at that in your free time, I guess. Um, Let's see, well, how do we do on time? Oh, we're almost out of time, cool. <laughs> Oops. Okay, so yeah, we're almost done actually. So the, the last bit of a BCI project is a prediction algorithm part. So once you have all these features, you want to be able to understand this. And as a human, it's kind of hard to like look at these numbers and be like, I can see this person is very sad right now. Um, I should have like put an example of what the numbers would look like, but I guess in the future workshop, we can do that. Um, so this is why we want to use machine learning and be able to model what this data would mean for the different states of the person. So some traditional ways that we would do this, which are a faster, the faster ways that sort of actually work better right now is these two different categories. If you've done machine learning, you know that there's some that are supervised and some that are unsupervised. Usually supervised works better, especially if you know like what the data would actually means. So first, you might want to use something like dimension reduction because with brain data, you would get a lot of different dimensions. Um, so a couple things you could do is like linear discriminant analysis or uh, common spatial patterns. So these would allow you to take these features and understand how to best separate them in terms of the actual features. Um, it's kind of hard to explain right now, but like, you would want to find a dimension, like looking at something like in the, the regular dimensions where you say, oh, this is theta and like this is beta or something, right? You plot something. And just, just looking at those two axes might not be the best. You might want to actually use a different axis to be able to better separate the data. So you might want to use like something like this where you have your positive case like here and your negative case here rather than trying to project down or trying to project this way for either case. Um, so linear discriminant analysis would do that automatically for you to minimize the differences between each of the populations, but maximize the differences between them. Wait, did I say that right? Yeah, within the populations, they will be minimized and between them, they'll be maximized. So you have the means as far as far apart from each other as possible, but then within each group, you get uh, the smallest so they look kind of like little clusters. And you also have common spatial patterns where you say you have someone, look, uh, someone with motor imagery data where you want to imagine going left or imagine going right. And you don't know, like, you don't know exactly which features might produce the thought of imagining going left or imagining going right. And so you have the labeled data and you want to maximize the variance in one one of the labels and then minimize the variance in the other. And that will give you a common spatial pattern to work from. So then you can use the variances sort of as like your, your inputs or your way to discriminate between them. Um, there's also support vector machines, um, which are just different ways to draw lines and ensemble learning, which is different ways to sort of like put together different models. And this actually is fairly, um, they actually give a lot of good results, especially in Kaggle competitions. So if you if one model isn't working, just like try another one and then put them together and then do different things with different models to um, have like a population vote as like what the actual prediction of 
this person's state would be. Um, that usually works the best. Um, I included some words there so you can look it up on your own if you want. There's also unsupervised learning. So principal component analysis is very similar to LD linear discriminant analysis, but um, you don't need the labels for it. Um, it does it in such a way that so you don't know the actual labels for them, so you don't actually group them into anything, but you can reduce or you can find the most useful dimensions from that. And so usually people would say like PC1 or PC2. PC1 would be like the highest like correlation -y, uh, dimension. So you can use that the best to sort of um, discriminate between two groups. Um, and then there's k-means and clustering. So with unsupervised, you can like best group things as best you can. That's kind of like the main idea there. But you can imagine that if you don't know what they, the clusters should be, then it's pretty hard to actually like cluster them. So it won't be that accurate. Uh, I see we have a question about uh, imagining visual images. So VRPs. OK, I'll go back a little bit. Cool. So. Um, so do you mean VEPs? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so when the user imagines an image, um, there is research that has shown that that does sort of light up your V1 cortex in a certain way. Um, I'm not too sure about the sensitivity about that, so I, I would need to look into that, but that, that's a pretty interesting idea where if you like sort of imagine a house or imagine a face, then you would get two different sort of reactions inside your visual cortex. And you can sort of think about how you might wanna use that as input into your VCI system. Um, so that, that's pretty interesting. I don't really know um, not necessarily. There, it's it's a less it's a less sort of response. The response is not as great, but there is still a noticeable response that is greater than like normal. So if you're not seeing anything, it would be kind of like flat. But then, um, if you're imagining a house, it would be kind of smallish. But then, if you're actually seeing a house, it'd be like greater. So I only know of research that has done like actual imagery, but I'm pretty sure there is research doing it on imaginary responses as well. Um, I just don't, yeah. I think a more common case of this, is tell me if I'm wrong, but there's this part of the brain called a mu rhythm, uh, and there's this uh, system in your brain called mirror neurons. And what these things do is they activate as if you're doing an action when you're looking at an action. And uh, people, there's, there's not way too much research on it yet. It, I think it got discovered in the 90, 1991 or something, but people think that it might be responsible for when a uh, person's on the autism spectrum, that they don't have as good of mu rhythm or they don't have as good of, uh, sorry, mirror neuron detection. So it's harder for them to sympathize with other people. But basically what this is basically is saying is if you watch someone like swimming or jumping or reaching their hand out or something, you would get uh, potentials as if you're doing the same thing. And I don't know if that, Follows under the same principle as VEP, but I think it might be related. Yeah, I think it's well. pretty similar because, like, you're sort of like for mirror neurons, it would be in a different part of your brain. Like, yeah, that one's more in your Broca's area bit, so it's yeah. not in your uh, V1. Instead, it's in your uh, primal cortex. But it's it kind of can that that kind of idea can basically help you visualize how something like that might happen. Like when you when you think about something or imagine doing something, it evoke something very similar as if you're doing it yourself. Yeah. So I think the takeaway message is that the signal might not be as great as if you were to actually do it because you would not have like the synchrony of like multiple brain parts that react to actually seeing it or actually doing the motion in addition to like the mirror neurons or like the imaginary neurons. So even though you would still see some, like it has been shown that some brain recordings would give you like at least half as half the like amplitude, um, it won't be as great. So um, being able to see whether or not we can detect that is pretty interesting for BCIs. I will need to look into if there's actual research and how successful they've been with that. Okay. Cool, so, all right. 
we've gone through prediction algorithms. Um, these are the traditional approaches. Does anyone have any questions about these? Yeah, they might seem really scary, but most of these are pretty much just libraries in MATLAB or Python, and they're, uh, understanding the math behind them is nice, but it's not entirely necessary as long as you know when a certain algorithm is better than another. So don't get too intimidated by uh, all the math and <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's really scary when you like, you're like just jumping into ML and stuff. And the reality is a lot of smart people have already done a lot of work making it a lot easier to run a lot of these algorithms on data sets. Yeah. Yeah. The cool thing about this is there's a lot of like tutorials for each like one of these and you can like sort of go through a Python tutorial and sort of understand even like the underlying mathematics behind it. So cool. So um, some more prediction algorithms that have been under high scrutiny these recent years are with neural networks. And so like the, the great thing about being able to use neural networks to understand neural data is that you can, instead of picking out the actual features that we were talking about before, um, you can sort of use these neural networks to sort of do that for you. And so they'll potentially be able to pick out better features than you might be able to craft on your own. Um, but currently, um, most of the neural networks have a high risk of overfitting and they don't really work too well in uh, online scenarios. So online means like I'm working with a, like someone put the thing on their head and then you have to sort of use that to, um, yeah, you have to use, use that to like interact with the computer, sorry. Um, yeah, so because of the high risk of overfitting, um, just people are just trying to figure out more and more how to make them better. Um, so these are just some of the ideas that people have been looking into. Um, uh, Yun Dong, do you want to add about any of these? Just as like an intro. Sure. Um, so I, so from speaking from my experience, I don't really recommend you guys to use a uh, very deep new networks for your BCI project because uh, uh, just because of its uh, overfitting problem. So, uh, and most of the BCI applications are just binary classification problems, right? So you just want to classify into either zero or one, left or versus right. So uh, since the problem is pretty simple, then I, 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 don't rec I don't actually recommend you guys to use uh, new networks because uh, when they like, if you look at the neural network and the, the, develop, the, the development of neural network in the recent decade, decade uh, you can see that like it solves very complicated problems such as computer vision, uh, understanding language. Uh, and because neural network has such a capa capacity to learn things, uh, it actually performs very well on those, uh, on those uh, complicated problems. But when it comes to very simple problems, then uh, it will learn, so most of the things it will learn is just noise, right? So suppose like you have, like you can imagine like there are tons of noise from the EJ signal and uh, probably the new network just learn off those signals. And uh, at the end of the day, like during test stage, then it will just overfit. So for example, if you have like a binary classification, your result might just be, your accuracy might just be like a, a 0.55, right? So uh, that's pretty likely. And uh, uh, that's the, the cons of the new network, but the, pro, the pros is that, uh, well, it's very similar to our mind. Like if you look at new network, it's very similar to how our brain works, right? So you can draw similar, similarities between our brain and the new networks and design neural networks better with the structure of our, our brain. <clears throat> so uh, in the past a few years, we have seen like long short-term memory. Uh, it's, for, it's for handling sequential data. And the sequential data is, is very similar to EEG data, right? Because it's, it, it has a temporal a dimension. And uh, uh, I have seen some, some 
like there are lots of people who are using LSTM to handle EG data. And yeah, it, it actually works, but uh, you still need to worry about like uh, to print, uh, to pre prevent the overfitting problem. So uh, also the problem is LSTM is, is pretty old. It is born in uh, 1997, which is the same age as me. So uh, since such model is old, then like it might just lack some some the most advanced features. Uh, and uh, training a temporal new type is actually takes a long time to, to do that. So another like a uh, another way to tr do that is just using a convolutional neural network and regard the temporal dimension as a um, as a tem regards the temporal dimension as a spatial dimension. So as as you can, if you are familiar with CNN, then you sh you should know that it can do uh, classification on images very well because it uh, considers considers all spatial information. Uh, that's for CN. Then auto encoder is um, so you imagine you want to auto encode a picture into some a smaller dimension feature vectors. Then using auto encoder is is pretty good. But uh, for EEG data, I don't think there is too much use because uh, there are lots of noise within our uh, EEG data, and it will just encode all those noise into a small uh, feature vector, and uh, it might not work well. A big thing about the success, success of neural network is just the is the, the transfer learning. So imagine how you have already trained a neural network for one problem, and then uh, you want to uh, train another neural network for another problem, but the problem the two are very similar. Uh, then you can use transfer learning. So you have already a pre pre trained NN, then you you might just want to add one more small layer. At the end, and uh, train only train that small layer on top of everything else, and uh, that will uh, uh, significantly significantly uh, speed up the training process for our new network, right? And also, it it works pretty well uh, in reality. Uh, so next one is transformer. So transformer is a very recent hot topic. Uh, the the idea is that you uh, have a Query and you have a queue, so you want to like attend the uh, the query using your key. Uh, and uh, the the problem with transformer is that like for it it's widely used in in language area, right? Uh, as as you you can you might just heard of some of them like the most popular one. Um, I, I can't forget the name. So, but uh, transformer is is widely used in language because your input and your output are both in very similar dimension, right? So you are translating, uh, you are translating from English to French, uh, but both of them are still lying in a language domain. Uh, so for for our EJ problem, uh, it's actually not that, it's not very similar to a language problem, problem because we're not translating EJ data to another, I mean, maybe another data type. So transformer is not widely used in uh, 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 in this PCI area, but uh, people are still working on that, like how to uh, use the uh, transformer unit to do some encoding and those use those encoding to uh, better uh, train our EG model. And the last thing I, I want to talk about is, is just reinforcement learning, and this is a very, uh, I would say, a very uh, controversial topic because. Uh, Reinforcement learning is pretty. Uh, it was very hot because uh, of the of a go, and uh, also uh, people think that oh maybe using trans using reinforcement learning you can create like a human like computer because it will, it, it can think, uh, but actually it's not true. So uh, in order to uh, do deep RL, we need to have a at least we need to have a si simulator right. If you want to work, if you want to develop your uh, your tool very fast, then you have to use a simulator because it will save a lot of time. You can you can restart from the beginning if you fail, and uh, design those simulators is is very complicated and it's also a CV problem, a, a computer vision problem. Um, so um, 
And uh, the problem is IR is, is that you need to generate a lot of live data during the trial. And uh, if, if you don't, if you don't run it, then you have, not, you have no data, right? You have no data to train the model. And uh, uh, so, so I would, for this, uh, I will say it's pretty hard to incorporate this idea into a PCI project. But uh, you, can, you can always try if you can figure out something new, something interesting with RL. And uh, that's all I want to talk about. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Hey. So Yundong's very uh, experienced with a lot of machine learning techniques. So if y'all have questions. <laughs> okay. So yeah, that pretty much wraps up what we have for you today. Um, if there's any more questions, feel free to ask. Um, but here is some information that would be useful for you to have. So we have the interest form poll, which will allow us to like plan the next workshop for next week. Um, so if you go to that first link, you can tell us what you want to see. If you want to apply to be an officer, um, I guess we didn't really get to talk about that too much. But if you're really interested in like the neurotech uh, field and want to get more involved, in the student community here and try to build this up in the coming years, work with companies and work with research labs, um, then apply to be an officer. We have a lot of open positions. So we would, uh, it's a great way to like learn re leadership techniques and soft skills and by working with people and also making new friends. Um, I would highly encourage that. If you need some more time to think about that, that's fine too. I hope you can join us next week. Uh, we also have a website, Facebook, and also a Discord. So if you want to just talk to us a little bit more after this, uh, we're always online. At least someone is usually. <laughs> um, so just go to that link, and then you can join our Discord from there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. And, and uh, as she said, uh, and if you want to see projects actually happening next year, then uh, becoming an officer would be a great idea, especially if you want that uh, experience. But, uh, thank you everyone for coming. If, you, if, if anyone has some last minute questions as well, I think uh, Jiling, Colin, and I are going to stay for, for a bit longer. Uh, let me go test them. Uh, maybe make sure you're signed into a UCSD email. That they should be working. Can anyone else uh, confirm if the app, the forms are working? <laughs>